Okay. So I'm recording this session because uh, I think it will be useful to uh, post this later because I'm going to do a little mini lecture on enzymes, okay? All right. So enzymes, what do, we, what do we know about enzymes? What's the function of enzymes? Go ahead and unmute yourselves. They're speed catalysts. Up reactions. Catalysts. Speed up reactions. They speed up chemical reactions, right? Catalysts. They speed up reactions. And how do enzymes do that? Anybody know? Lower the act what, activation? Enzyme? I heard someone say it. Yeah, exactly. They lower enzymes, speed up the rate of chemical reactions by lowering the activation energy. So I'm going to draw what's called a reaction profile. I'm going to put time on the see. X. Oh, you guys can't see? Sorry. Forgot, I forgot to hit screen share. Thank you. Okay. There we go. Can you guys see it now? Yes? Okay. So I'm going to draw what's called a reaction profile. So we have time on the x-axis, and we have something called G, which is free energy on the y-axis. Now, kids don't need to worry about calculating G or the difference between free energy and enthalpy in AP biology. Uh, that's no longer part of the curriculum. And the way I describe free energy to them for the kids who have not had chemistry, and even some of our chemistry teachers at our school don't get to thermodynamics because it's usually the last unit of the year. So even the kids who have had chemistry don't always know what this is. I just tell them that G is the amount of energy a given chemical has available to do work the amount of energy a chemical has available to do work, okay? So higher G values, free energy values are gonna be up here, lower ones are here, okay? So a reaction profile just shows the relative free energies of the reactions, of the reactants and the products. So let's say I'm doing a reaction and the reactants have a free energy that's about here and the products, of the chemical reaction have a free energy that's much lower, okay? So this reaction is downhill, okay? So if we calculated the change in free energy, delta G, the change in free energy is the final minus the initial. In other words, the free energy of the products minus the free energy of the reactants Family Zookeeper? I don't know who Family Zookeeper is. Uh, I don't want to get Zoom bombed, so I'm going to message them. Excuse me for a second. Let me just ask them to identify themselves. It's probably someone who is supposed to be here, but I just want to make sure. I told you about the time one of my chemistry students like had their uh, name as a bunch of emojis and I didn't let him in. Anyway, okay. So delta G, the change in free energy is the free energy of the products minus the free energy of the reactants, okay? And in this case, delta G in the way I drew this reaction is going to be negative, okay? Because the end, we're starting off with more free energy than we ended up with, right? This reaction's going downhill. So we're going to say this reaction is exergonic, okay? And it is spontaneous. Although I think uh, generally in education, they're getting away from this word spontaneous because it tends to confuse kids. Basically what that means when it's exergonic or spontaneous, uh, just like a ball rolling down a hill, this reaction is going to want to happen. It's energetically favorable. Does that make sense, everybody? Uh, Sonia, you don't see a reply in the chat to uh, my question asking them to identify themselves, do you? No. Oh, okay. Not yet. Alrighty. Okay. So thank you. So this reaction is downhill. Oh. It's energetically favorable, right? But to get chemical reactions to start, usually you have to destabilize the reactant in some way. Uh, you need to weaken its chemical bonds, usually by bending it or something, or you have to wait for the, um, the reactants to collide with each other. So there's a little energy bump you need to get over 
before you can form the product. So it's kind of like a little bit of energy needs to go in before you can continue downhill. And the difference in energy between the reactant and the top of this hill, which is called the transition state, the difference in this is called activation energy. Okay, and I just got a text, so I'm guessing that's Family Zookeeper. Let me, yeah. Ah, it's Marsha. Okay, let me go let her in. Excuse me, just for a second. Here, I'm going to stop this share so I can see my waiting room. There we go. Okay, let me go back over here. All right. Okay. Marsha, are you in now? Mom? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Great. Sorry, I didn't recognize your name. I just didn't want to get uh, Zoom bombed. Okay. So we're talking about enzymes. Okay, so uh, the activation energy is the amount of energy you need to put into the system to get to this transition state so that you can form the product, okay? And the analogy I make with my students is that the size of that activation energy is kind of like a speed bump. And the bigger the speed bump, what's the purpose of a speed bump? To slow you down, right? The bigger the speed bump, the slower you're gonna be able to drive over it. The bigger this speed bump, the bigger this activation energy, the slower the chemical reaction is gonna go, okay? And what enzymes do, enzymes often bind to the substrate, bind to the reactant, and usually bend it or destabilize it somehow so that the activation energy, the size of that speed bump is a little bit lower. So what I have here in red is the activation energy without the enzyme, but what I just drew in here in blue is the activation energy with an enzyme. A capital E subscript A is the way you abbreviate activation energy, okay? And the lower that activation energy is, the faster the chemical reaction is gonna go. Does that make sense, everybody? Okay, now, uh, there's another kind of chemical reaction you can do. Let me give myself a little bit more space here. Let me move these out of the way. Okay. And let's see if I can draw this. I don't want to erase this yet in case people are still writing this down. I'm just going to give myself a little bit of room. Now, not all chemical reactions are energetically favorable. Okay. So let's take a look at this one. I'm going to draw myself another reaction profile. Free energy is on the y-axis, time is on uh, the x-axis. Sometimes the free energy of the reactants is lower than the free, uh, free energy of the products, right? In that case, delta G or the change in free energy would be positive, not negative. So this would be like an uphill reaction. This is not called exergonic. This is called endergonic. This is energy, energetically unfavorable. So I'm just going to say unfavorable. It's not spontaneous. And the only way this reaction is going to happen, it's kind of like if you were trying to push a ball up a hill. If you're trying to push a ball up a hill, what's the, what do you have to put into the system to get that ball to go uphill? Energy. Energy. Yeah. Exactly, Sonia. You got to put energy. So this kind of reaction is you're going to need to put energy in to make it happen. This kind of reaction is going to release energy. And then when you're going through this with your students, this is an opportunity for you to talk about ATP and how the breakdown of ATP is energetically favorable and is exergonic. And that breakdown of ATP can be used to drive the energetically unfavorable reactions that are necessary for life, like forming new proteins and muscle cells and all that good stuff. Okay, so let me draw a reaction. Let me draw the reaction profile in for here. And remember, the activation energy is the difference between the energy of the reactants and the top of this transition state. And this activation energy without the enzyme is huge for an endergonic reaction, right? Okay, let me get a different color. And let's say we have the best enzyme uh, in the planet, in the universe. Even if we have the best enzyme in the world, in the universe, the best we're gonna do 
is still going to make this activation energy large, isn't it? Okay, because even if this enzyme somehow is able to draw a straight line between the reactant and the product, and this is an important thing for the kids to understand, can the enzyme change an energetically unfavorable endergonic reaction into an energetically favorable exergonic reaction? Can any enzyme do that? No. No. Because whether, an en whether a reaction is endergonic or exergonic depends on the relative positions of the reactants and the products. And, all, and the enzyme does not change that. Because like glucose is going to have an inherent amount of free energy in it. Carbon dioxide is going to have an inherent amount of free energy in it. The enzyme can't change that. All the enzyme, en enzyme can do is change that activation energy. Does that kind of make sense, you guys? Any questions on this so far? And I am recording this. So if you did, I'm going to erase this. Well, maybe I want to, well, I'm going to cover this up. Because I want to show you a way I demonstrate enzymes to my students. And there's lots of different ways to do it. Okay. There's a question in the chat. Yeah, go ahead. What's the question, Sonia? Uh, so why do you use endergonic and exergonic versus endothermic and exothermic? That's a great question. That's just the terminology that's used in chemistry. You use endothermic and exothermic when you're talking about H enthalpy. And you use endergonic and exergonic when you're talking about free energy, because free energy also takes into account what we call entropy changes or changes in disorder in the system, which is more detailed than what the kids need to know for AP Bio. But, you know, in chemistry class, sometimes we talk about that. So, but they're very similar. They're very similar concepts, right? Not always. Let me just emphasize that. Not always, but usually something that a reaction that is exothermic will also be exergonic. And usually a reaction that is endothermic will also be endergonic. That's usually true. It's not always true though, because of things like entropy changes and temperature can shift the balance a little bit, but most of the time those go together. Any other questions? I, I have a question, Mary. Um, actually it's two. So when I taught about, because I had the same question that Sonia did about um, endo and exergonic versus endo and exothermic, and I always taught the kids that thermic has heat, so endo, endergonic refers to energy like you're saying in general, but also energy can refer to as light. So then I, I'm like, if we're just talking about energy, is that a good way to think of it? Like we're not necessarily talking about heat per se in an exo, in an end. So yeah, yeah, it's it's reaction. more it's more than just heat. It's more than just a, a free energy is more than just heat. Yes, that is correct. Free energy also takes into account uh, the environmental temperature of the reaction uh, and the entropy level, the disorder level of the reaction. And then, secondly, would this be a good time to kind of spiral back to talking about um, photosynthesis and cellular respiration? Like when you're, you know, making glucose, what kind of a reaction is it? And when you're breaking yeah, glucose? You, you could do that. I usually do enzymes before I do photosynthesis and respiration, uh, but you could do photosynthesis and respiration first and then talk about enzymes. So absolutely nothing wrong with that. So they all, they all kind of go together, don't they? Okay. Would students ever have to calculate Delta G? No. No, and I don't think that's on the formula sheet anymore either. Oh, no, but it's like read it off of a graph. Like if they gave them one of these graphs, no. I don't think so. I don't think, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe read the graph, reading the graph, maybe. But they wouldn't, uh, I, they wouldn't have to use the equation delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. That used to be on the formula sheet in 24 years. I never saw it on the test. And finally, last year, they took it off the formula sheet. So... They might need to read it off a graph, but I, th I think the more important thing for them to understand is that this is downhill, therefore it's exergonic and it's energetically favorable. This is uphill, therefore it's endergonic and it's energetically unfavorable. And this, the amount of energy you have to put in to get the reaction started is activation energy. And what enzymes do is they destabilize the reactants in some way um, or bring them together to lower that activation energy so that the reaction can happen faster. 
Does that make sense? Any other questions before I move on? Okay, I'm going to show you a little thing um, that I use when I teach about enzymes with my students. Make sure I got this set up correctly here. Okay. All right. So are any of you uh, familiar with the company 3D Molecular Designs? Uh, 3D Molecular Designs sells these really cool models. And I, over the years, I have managed to accumulate a number of them. But it kind of makes me sad with distance learning because the kids aren't going to be able to use them. But um, this is one of their less expensive models. Uh, this is called their Enzymes in Action Kit. But I think you could make something like this on your own with craft foam from the art supply store really easily. So this piece, this piece of craft foam represents the enzyme, okay? And this is going to represent my substrate. Okay, substrate is what we call the reactant when we're talking about enzyme catalyzed reactions. Okay, and the substrate binds to the enzyme. Okay, and where does the substrate bind to the enzyme? At the, what do we call the place where it binds? Begins with an A. Active site. Active site, there we go. So right here is the active site and the substrate fits nicely right in there into the active site. Okay, if that, this is part of what gives enzymes their specificity, right? If the substrate does not fit into the active site, that substrate's not going to bind there. Just kind of like with a cell signaling, if the ligand doesn't bind, it doesn't fit into the receptor molecule, nothing's going to happen. So here's my substrate binding to the active site, right? Okay, now shape is not the only thing that determines whether the substrate binds to the active site. So I'm going to flip this over now. And again, you could just make this yourself. Uh, enzymes usually are made of proteins, right? Sometimes they're made of RNA. Those are called ribozymes. But most of the time, enzymes are made of proteins, right? And proteins have those side chains called R groups. Some of those side chains are neutral you know, are uh, nonpolar, but some of those R groups, some of those side chains in the amino acids that make up proteins are charged. So this is indicating an active site that has an amino acid here that has a negative charge and an amino acid here that has a positive charge, okay? So here's my substrate again. And if my substrate has a negative charge on this side, and a positive charge on that side, so much the better, because not only is the shape of the substrate gonna fit into the shape of the active site, the charges on the surface of the substrate and the surface of the active site are also compatible, right? Because opposite charges attract. So the, pro the primary thing that determines whether a substrate uh, binds to an enzyme is its shape and whether the shape fits into the active site. But often the charges in the side chains along the surface of the active site and the surface of the substrate or reactant also come into play. Does that kind of make sense? And just for contrast, I have another substrate here. And what do you notice about the shape of this substrate? Similar. Yeah, it's, it's actually exactly the same. Yeah. It's exactly the same. But is this substrate going to want to bind to this enzyme at that active site? Mm -hmm. And I see people shaking their heads. Why not? Like charges. Like, char like, like charges, charges repel. So even though the shape fits, this isn't going to hang out there very long because the charges are incompatible. So it's not going to bind. And this one will, and this guy won't. That kind of makes sense. So I think that kind of stuff is what makes the difference between a kid getting a four or a five is that most kids are going to understand that the shape of the substrate determines whether it can fit into the active site. But that kid who gets that extra point, it will also understand that there are often charges in these side chains that uh, either help or inhibit the binding of the molecule to the active site. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. And again, I don't want to sound like I'm selling this kit, 
this, this is a cool kit. It's a really nice women-owned company, like a retired teacher, I think, runs it and stuff, and they make some good stuff. But you could make this, you could make something similar to this on your own. Do you guys, can you guys all visualize how that would go? Just go to Michael's you know, or some other art supply store and get some of that craft foam, and you can cut those up. All right. Now, enzymes can be inhibited. Okay, and there's two kinds of inhibitors that can inhibit enzyme catalyzed reactions that kids need to know about for AP bio competitive inhibitors and non competitive or allosteric inhibitors. So you have competitive inhibitors or non competitive, which are called uh, allosteric, and the spelling's sorry, right Mary. there. Yeah, go uh, ahead. We have a, a few comments here on the, the chat. Mm -hmm. So Lydia shares that she does something like this with her regular bio kits. And um, Shelly she says that they have a water model from the same company. That oh, the use. water model is fantastic. I, the magnetic water molecules, I love those. And uh, Shaoni has this question. I think I'm saying her name wrong, sorry. Uh, what are the kits called again? 3D Molecules? Uh, yeah, the name of the company is 3D Molecular Designs. 3D Molecular Designs, and this particular kit I'm using this morning is called the Enzyme in Action Kit. 3D Molecular Designs is the company. Enzyme in Action Kit is the name of the kit. Thank you so much, Sonia. You're doing a great job as a, a chat monitor this morning. Um, and something that kind of makes me sad is that uh, 3D Molecular Designs also has a lending library. So even if you couldn't afford the kits, you would be able to log on and reserve any one of their kits for a three week period. They would send it to you for free and all you would have to do is pay return postage. But uh, since the pandemic, they shut that down because they're trying to figure out how to sterilize the kits in between classes. And, and recently, I haven't checked out the prices on this. Uh, recently, um, they just released single pack kits because usually when you buy their kits it comes like this one i think it comes in a set of six so you can have your kids in six lab groups and i have two of the six packs that sounds kind of weird i have two six packs in my class i've got two of the six packs in my class so i can have uh 10 or 12 groups when we're playing with these but i've heard that recently they're coming out with single pack ones so those might be cheaper uh, to get if you and if you're demonstrating stuff for your students that might be since we're probably not going to spend as much money on chemicals this year uh, that might be a good investment of some of your science budget I mean only you can determine that anyway thank you okay can I move on to in inhibition so we have competitive inhibition and non-competitive or allosteric inhibition here we have a competitive inhibitor, okay? Uh, is the competitive inhibitor the, exactly the same shape as the substrate? No, but look what the competitive inhibitor can do. The competitive inhibitor can block that active site, can't it? It is not the same molecule, it does not have the same shape, but it has a similar enough shape that it can pop in here, and once that competitive inhibitor is in there, even though this wants to go there, our substrate cannot pop in, can it? Okay, so this is a competitive inhibitor. Competitive inhibitors are called competitive inhibitors because they, excuse me, I know we're not supposed to use the word to define the word, but they compete with the substrate for the active site. Okay, um, questions on that? Uh, an important thing for kids to realize about competitive inhibitors, let's say you introduce a competitive inhibitor into a reaction. How could you mitigate or dampen the effects of a competitive inhibitor? What could you add to the reaction since it's a competition? Could increase the or amount of um, substrate. substrate. Substrate, exactly. You could flood the reaction with a whole bunch more substrate. And often when someone comes into an emergency room and they've swallowed a poison or they've OD'd on something, uh, sometimes what they do is they will flood their body with some other thing, saline solution or something that's going to uncompete whatever the bad thing was. 
that they have in their body to undo that. Does that kind of make sense? So one of the ways you can distinguish the effects of a competitive inhibitor and a non-competitive inhibitor is that the effect of a competitive inhibitor can be mitigated by adding lots more substrate. So if I had one molecule of the competitive inhibitor for every 10 molecules of substrate, that's gonna have a much worse effect than if I had one molecule of inhibitor for every 10,000 molecules of substrate, right? So that's how you can, and you could like draw a graph showing how that would work. You guys all follow that? So this is our competitive inhibitor, all right? You also have non-competitive or allosteric inhibitors, okay? This allosteric inhibitor doesn't really fit into the active site. It's like all loose, it like can try, but it's gonna probably pop right back out because it doesn't really fit as tightly as our competitive inhibitor did, right? Okay, this is called a non-competitive or allosteric inhibitor because it binds not at the active site, it binds on another site of the enzyme called the allosteric site which is what this little cutout is here, which I think some of you probably were wondering, what is that, okay? So this is the allosteric site. It is not the active site. It is not where the substrate binds. Our non-competitive or allosteric inhibitor comes in here and you slide it in and watch what happens to the enzyme. As I slide that piece in, what happened to the enzyme? Change the shape. I change the shape. And we all know if you change the shape of something, you change its function. function. You change a function. So when this allosteric inhibitor comes in here, it changed the shape of the active site. And now the substrate can no longer get in there. Does that make sense? Yeah. With the allosteric or non-competitive inhibitor, would flooding the test tube with the whole bunch more molecules of substrate help at all? No, it wouldn't help, right? Because flooding a whole bunch more substrate is not gonna change that this is binding to the allosteric site. That kind of makes sense, you guys? Okay. Um, another tool I really like uh, for teaching about uh, enzymes is on HHMI Biointeractive. And a few years ago, 3D printers were very rare, but I think more and more schools are getting access to 3D printers. Do any of you have access to a 3D printer on your campus, like maybe your shop class or something? Some county offices of education even have them available now where you can go in there. Anyway, if you go to HHMI Biointeractive, they have a section about 3D models and you can print out it and it's the file and you download the file and I downloaded it and I just handed it off to our shop teacher who had a 3D printer and you can print out the BCR ABLE enzyme and the B a 3D model of it. And the BCR ABLE enzyme is an enzyme that's found in uh, cancer cells in something called uh, CML, chronic myelogenous leukemia. Uh, there's a mutation in the cancer cells that cause it to make an enzyme called BCR able enzyme. Sorry to interrupt, Mary. Uh, Taylor had just uh, posted, she was asking about the same thing. Anyone who is familiar with 3D printers, does this seem like something that can be printed? I have a generous friend with, with one who would make me a set. Yeah, so check out HHMI Biointeractive at their 3D uh, models. You can just download the file. So the BCR ABLE enzyme is in the leukemia cells in a CML, in chronic myelogenous leukemia. And what it does, uh, this enzyme binds to ATP, okay? And then once it binds to ATP, it activates a whole bunch of other molecules in the cell and causes mitosis or cell division to go way out of control and your white blood cell counts go through the roof and you have leukemia, okay? Um, on the biointeractive site, you can get the instructions, the file for printing out the enzyme, for printing out a model of ATP. Now, 20 years ago, 20 years ago, the five-year survival rate for CML was less than 10%. 
okay? It was not a good kind of leukemia to have, not that there's a good kind, but it was a particularly bad kind of leukemia. 20 years ago, the five-year survival rate for this kind of leukemia was less than 10%. And then uh, scientists, notably uh, Charles Sawyer, who was at UCLA at the time, and uh, Brian Drucker, who I think is still at University of, Arizona, uh, University of Oregon Health Sciences Center, figured out what the shape of the active site on this enzyme was, okay? ATP would fit into that active site. And then I tell my students, okay, if they know the shape of the active site, and they know that ATP binds to it, and that's what causes the cells to grow out of control. If you're a cancer researcher, what do you want to try to design to treat this form of leukemia based on what we just learned about enzymes? An allosteric competitor. Well, an allosteric competitor, but better yet, um, a com a, a just a regular, one. yeah, just a regular competitive inhibitor. If you know the shape of that active site, an allosteric one would work as well, but a competitive one might be a little bit more direct, right? So that's what they did, and they tested hundreds of compounds, and then in I think 2000, 2001, they came up one, with one that's uh, now marketed under the name Gleevec. And this is a competitive inhibitor of the BCR able enzyme, okay? And it was, it's pretty amazing. And it's not really a cure because people have to keep taking this drug forever to keep their leukemia under control. But there are now people who were in the, in the initial clinical trial of this drug who are still alive 20 years later. And the five-year survival rate for this form of leukemia now is greater than 90%. Wow. That's yeah, cool. it's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? This was one of the first examples of personalized medicine. Because if you have the BCR able mutation, they can give you this drug. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so when kids, I really like to talk about this example with my class. Because when kids go, why do we need to learn this? This is why you need to learn this because people used to die of this. And now most of the people who have it don't die of it. And using a 3D printer and the files on Biointeractive, you can print out a copy, uh, a 3D model of the enzyme. You can print out a 3D model of the ATP and you can print out a 3D model of the drug Gleevec and the kids actually can stick the Gleevec model in the active site of this enzyme and see how it blocks the ATP from getting in. Isn't that, isn't that super cool? It's, yeah. it's super cool. So, and when my shop teacher got his new 3D printer, he wasn't sure what to use it for. So of course I jumped on that and he printed out like 10 sets for me. So I've got 10 enzymes, 10 ATPs, 10 Gleevex, so the kids can like play with that and stuff. So it's really kind of fun. Yeah. All right. So that was kind of a long, whoops, let me zoom out. That was kind of a long intro to our enzyme lab here. Okay. Any questions on the background information? Okay, so let me show you the chemicals we're going to use for the yeast sphere enzyme lab. And you pro there was a video I posted the other day that had instructions on how to make up these chemicals. Okay, I'm going to angle this a little bit so that you can see the side view. Okay, I think this, just trying to make sure. Okay, I think this will be a little bit, oh, I'm still trying to zoom out. Okay, I think this will be a little better. Okay, in this glass, I've got the sodium alginate. And the sodium alginate, I don't know if you can see this or not, it's really super viscous. Uh, this is a 2% sodium alginate solution. Um, you want to make this up at least 48 hours before the lab. And as I said in the video, don't do it on a magnetic stir because if you do, all the powder is going to clump in the vortex and it'll be all clumpy, clumpy and nasty. So what I do, I just put 100 mils of water in a 150 or 200 mil beaker. And then I take my two grams, because 2% means two grams per 100 mils. And I sprinkle the two grams of powder across the surface. And you just let it sit without stirring. And it'll just dissolve on its own in about 48 hours. Now, this is really viscous and difficult to pour out. So I make up 100 mils for every two lab groups to share, because I have lab islands along the back of my room and I have two lab groups sharing one lab table. So two lab groups would uh, share that. Okay, so here's our sodium alginate. Okay, in this cup, this is the calcium lactate that we're going to use. Okay, 
me move that little. Okay, uh, calcium lactate. Um, it's a 0.15 molar solution. Now in the procedure that is uh, linked to this document, and I did not write this lab, Pam Breyer, who's a college professor at Bowdoin College, super nice lady. Uh, Pam Breyer wrote this. Pam uses calcium chloride. Calcium chloride is poisonous, calcium lactate isn't, and calcium lactate uh, still works. Um, and here's why. It is because the reason calcium lactate works is that the sodium alginate, okay, sodium of course is a plus ion, right? Alginate is a negative ion with a minus one charge. And calcium lactate, okay, lactate has a negative charge. Uh, calcium has a plus two charge, right? So all you really need is a calcium ion because when you mix the sodium alginate with the calcium lactate, Every calcium ion, because it has a plus two charge, is going to be attracted to two alginate ions because the alginate has a minus one charge. So you could theoretically use any calcium containing salt to make this work. Why do I use calcium lactate? Because if you go to Amazon, there's a company called Modernist Pantry, and you can buy a two pack. I think I actually have one here. Yeah, I think it was, I think it cost $17.99 from Modernist Pantry. You get this two pack and this two pack comes with uh, 50 grams of sodium alginate and you only need two grams to make 100 mils of this and 50 grams of the calcium lactate and they come together. And these are actually completely safe. Kids could eat these chemicals and they'd be okay. I do not tell my students that, okay. Uh, the, it's used by uh, chefs who cook at restaurants fancier than the ones my husband and I go, go to on date night. But I guess like what you do, instead of just putting a sauce or gravy on something, you mix the gravy or sauce with the sodium alginate and the calcium lactate, and you make like flavor pearls. It's kind of like sauce boba. So you get like a burst of flavor when you bite into it. That's like the theory. But anyway, we're going to use sodium alginate and calcium lactate to make what I jokingly call with my students yeast boba. Okay, so this, this lab is far safer than uh, the Guayacol lab. Okay, so you've got 2% sodium alginate, you've got 0.15 molar calcium lactate, and you've got a 10% yeast solution. Okay, and I make the, this, the sodium alginate and the calcium lactate you make up in advance. The calcium lactate actually dissolves pretty quickly, but the yeast I make up fresh right before we do the lab. So I was doing that about 10 minutes before nine. And this is 10% yeast, uh, which is 10 grams of yeast per 100 mils. Okay, and then here's what you're going to do. Let me show you how to make these little balls. And then what you do, you make these little balls, these little boba of yeast, which is your enzyme, and you drop them into hydrogen peroxide, okay? And hydrogen peroxide breaks down into water and oxygen bubbles. I think I need to put, wait, no, two goes here, two goes here, there we go. Now it's balanced, that's balanced, right? Yeah, okay, hydrogen peroxide breaks down into water and oxygen bubbles. So I don't know if you guys noticed, I've got a 100 mil cylinder here. That 100 mil cylinder is filled with just regular drugstore hydrogen peroxide in the brown bottle, which is 3%, okay? So after I make the yeast balls, I drop them uh, one at a time into that hydrogen peroxide. And they're gonna initially sink. And then I have that, but as soon as the hydrogen peroxide starts to break down, they're gonna generate oxygen bubbles. And when enough oxygen bubbles are generated, those little balls of yeast boba are going to start to float. So what I have the kids record is the time it takes the enzyme ball, the yeast ball, from the time it hits the hydrogen peroxide, the total time it takes it for it to sink and to float back up to the top. And it's really a fun lab for the kids to do. Okay, so do you guys kind of understand the basics of the ends, of the, what we're doing here? Okay, so I've got, yeah, go ahead. Question? Oh, I thought I heard a question. All right, I'm going to stir up my yeast a little bit because it probably settled while I was talking. 
And I just use Fleshman's Rapid Rise Dry Yeast. Why? Because that's what Pam said to use, and you can get it at the grocery store. And I just have the kids in a separate beaker or a cup, just at equal volumes of, or my paper towels, of yeast solution to sodium alginate. And I just have them eyeball it because the sodium alginate especially is really super viscous and it's not going to pour well into a cylinder and it certainly isn't going to work in a pipette. So let me angle this so you can get like a little better view here. So I added about that much yeast. I'm going to add about an equal volume of sodium alginate. I probably went a little crazy with the sodium alginate. Okay, I'm gonna add a little bit more yeast. Okay. All right, now I'm going to take something to stir it with. Okay, so. Take my little spoon here. You can just, and in, uh, in the classroom, I just use a glass, have the kids use a glass stirring rod to do this. Oh, Jacob's here. Let me buzz Jacob in. And it takes a minute. You want to make sure you get that slurry relatively even. That looks pretty good. Okay. All right. And this is a good opportunity for you to point out to the kids. Okay. So I started out with 10% yeast. I made, uh, I did a one-to-one -one mixture of sodium alginate to 10% yeast. So that means the final concentration of yeast here is 5% now what we're using, right? Okay, now remember this uh, glass has my calcium lactate. So now you take one of those 10 cc syringes, the same ones you used for the floating leaf disc lab, and just have the kids pull up a couple mils of this slurry in their syringe. They don't need very much. And then this is what the guy was doing in the video about making the algae balls. So the procedure I'm using now is exactly the same as what you would use to make the algae balls, but instead of using 10% yeast, that's going to be your concentrated algae culture. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. So I'm going to take this, let me angle this a little better so you can see, and with slow, even pressure, I'm going to drop uh, drop by drop, I'm going to put this slurry inside my calcium lactate. Okay, so here we go. And I have the kids do this part. The kids love making their little yeast balls. So I'm just trying to do slow, even pressure. And can you guys see how it's making like the little enzyme balls here? Yeah. It's kind of fun. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to warn you about something. Every class, in fact, even when I do this with my workshop participants face-to-face, -face, there's going to be one person who discovers that if you push it really fast, you're going to make something that looks like a little sperm, okay? So just be aware of that, okay? And once one group figures out how to make a little sperm out of it, everybody's going to want to do it because they're kids and that's what they do, right? Okay, so I've got my little yeast balls here. Does everyone see that? Okay, when you do this with your students, you want to tell them, you let them sit for at least five minutes so they have a chance to polymerize before you rinse them off and start to use them. Now, I have block periods, so I can do this lab start to finish. I, I do the explanation like I did for you guys. I do that the day before. But the kids can make their own yeast balls and carry out their own experiment within a 90-minute period just fine. If you do not have a block period, if you have a more traditional 45 or 50-minute period, the kids can make their yeast balls, and then they can let this sit overnight. In the, I would put it in the fridge just in case to, to limit any bacterial contamination. They can make these in advance, let them sit overnight in the fridge, and then come in the next day and do their experiment. Okay, so I'm going to drain these yeast balls here. And what I usually do is I have these little mini colanders I got on sale at one of those cooking stores a long time ago. So I have the kids put a mini colander over a big old beaker and they just pour this out, but I don't have a mini colander here. So I am going to get, I don't have any cheesecloth either. Cheesecloth works well. Uh, we're just going to put a paper towel here, okay, because we want to drain off the calcium lactate so it doesn't interfere with the reaction, 
Okay, so I'm going to pour this into the paper towel. Okay, I'm just letting the liquid drain through the paper towel. And now I have my little yeast balls, like almost all the liquid's gone. Okay, and then I'm going to see if I can do this without spilling it all over. I'm going to put my yeast balls back in the cup and just add a little water to them because you don't want them to dry out. Probably should not be touching these with my bare fingers, but. Is it okay if it's normal water, not distilled? Oh yeah, I always use tap water. But again, that, that's probably more a function of what the quality of tap water is in your lab. Okay, I forgot to bring water. So I'm just gonna pop over to my kitchen and put some water on top of these because you don't want these to dry out. Uh, the other thing you want to make sure you do is you tell the kids as soon as they make their yeast balls, they want to rinse out these syringes with water because you don't want this stuff solidifying in, in your syringes. So I'm just going to do that really quick. Already, already, we are ready to do our lab with this now. Okay. All right. Any questions about the steps I've done so far? Okay. Now I'm going to ask someone to please be our timer. Because I'm going to drop this in there. So, what I did, I put a dark piece of paper behind this so it would be a little bit easier to see. So in this 100 mil cylinder, I've got a 3% hydrogen peroxide. I've got my yeast balls here. And then I take, you could do this with tweezers, but I take one of the inoculating loops left over from the PGLO kit. And then I pick up one of these yeast balls. Okay. And we drop it in the graduated cylinder and we time how long it takes from the time I drop it to the time it rises back up to the top. Is there someone who has their phone handy with the timer function who can time this for us, please? I got you. So okay. you got me? Okay, was that you, Kevin? I yeah. tell. Okay, thank you. All right, so I'm gonna go one, two, three, go. When I say go, start your timer, okay? Yes. All right, one, two, three, go. Got it. Thank you. So you guys see how that just, that sunk all the way down to the bottom. And it's not moving yet. There it goes. Kids love this. And stop. Uh, how long was that? 15 seconds. Okay, let's try it again. And when I saw Pam demonstrate this about five years ago at NSTA, I was like, whoa, this is really cool. And it was kind of funny because she was doing it in one of those big conference rooms that has like 50 people in it. And you like saw all these nerd teachers like me like rush the stage suddenly to get closer because they all wanted to see it. Hey, I did have a little bit of lag in the video, so I don't know if that affected the time. Do you usually get it faster? Uh, it, it kind of depends on how fresh the yeast is and stuff. You know what I mean? So, well, let's do this again because I want to show you how consistent this is. You ready, Kevin? You yeah, may Okay, one, two, three, whoop, go. And if you get really close, you can actually see, stop. You can actually see the oxygen, the bubbles trailing it, which is kind of fun. How, what was the time that time? 
That we were fourteen point seven. Okay, so still pretty close, right? So let's do one more. And I love this lab because it's safer. I mean, the most dangerous thing we're using is the hydrogen peroxide, right? And yeah. you can get the stuff relatively inexpensively. And the kids get to do a lot of the experimental design. All right. One, two, three, go. And stop. What was the time on that? 14.8. Isn't that amazing how consistent it is, you guys? It is remarkably consistent. Okay. Now, um, this is not my original saying, but I've heard people <clears throat> bandy this about in the AP Bio Facebook group and in the AP teacher community. And the saying goes something like this. It's not the labs you do. It's what you do with the labs. It's not the labs you do. It's what you do with the labs, okay? What can we do with this lab? Well, when I do this with my students, I have them do at least five trials for each condition they do. And when you have multiple replicants, we can set up a spreadsheet and we can have them calculate standard error of the mean and they can draw 95% confidence intervals on their graphs, right? Okay, uh, this is also great for experimental design. <clears throat> what do you think are some independent variables we could change with this lab? Well, my first question was, yeah, with my control, would it, like a similar cylinder with water then? Well, but if you that, that's an interesting question. So, if we had a cylinder with water, what would happen when we added the enzyme? Will we get any reaction at all? So that would be like your negative con control. It would just sink and it would stay down there. So you can do that. Yeah, so that could be one of your controls. So what are some independent variables the kids could vary on this? Mary, when I've done this in the past, we've tested pH. So mm -hmm. we've done like five different, I think three, five, seven, nine, eleven. 11 and then yeah. test the rate of the reaction there. Yeah, so you could do pH. So the way I have my kids do pH, they make their enzyme balls, and then if we were doing it the way Kristen suggested, I would have them put those enzyme balls in five different beakers at five different pHs and expose the enzyme to those pHs for at least five or 10 minutes before they go and they try to carry out the reaction in the cylinder with the hydrogen peroxide. Uh, what else? So that's a great suggestion, Kristen. Thank you. So pH, what else could they do? Temperature. Concentration of temperature, temperature, same thing. They could put them in different beakers and expose them to different temperatures. I just have kids nuke them in the microwave for just a couple seconds. They can put some in an ice water bath and see how that works. I thought I heard someone say something else. What else could they change? Oh, I, I said concentration of hydrogen peroxide. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good one. Concentration of substrate. And that one's really easy to do, right? Uh, what I'm using here is 3% hydrogen peroxide, which you get at the drugstore. Uh, I have kids dilute it up. 3%, 2%, 1%, half a percent. And see the difference in substrate concentration. Since I also teach chemistry in our stock room, we usually have 30% hydrogen peroxide in the back room, which is like super kind of dangerous. So, but, so if kids want to use a slightly higher concentration, if they ask me for that, I'll make up a 6% or a 9% solution. I do not give them the 30%. 30% is what they use for that elephant toothpaste, toothpaste, yeah. toothpaste yeah. demo. Yeah, 30%. Yeah, don't let the kids, I, I wouldn't let my kids handle 30%. Yeah. Uh, uh, what else? Uh, yeah. Uh, Lydia has a, a question or a suggestion that we can change the size of the balls. Is that possible? Yes. Uh, so I'm using the 10 cc syringes that we use in the photosynthesis lab, but I also have some 1 cc syringes in my room. I also have a couple of those really big 60 cc ones. I've had kids do that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Other suggestions? Uh, you could change the enzyme concentration. So in this cup here, oh, you guys can't see it because I'm not sharing my screen. Let me go back to sharing the, okay, let me go back to this. 
And this cup over here, I have, uh oh, I should have labeled these. That's bad lab procedure. I should have labeled, yeah. This is, instead of 10% yeast, uh, this is 15% uh, yeast I have here. So let me, I've got another empty cup. So I'm going to, let me give this a little stir. And I'm just gonna add equal proportions of 10% yeast. Oops, wait, that's not sodium alginate. Oops, am I sodium alginate? Okay, so what am I doing here? What am I varying? Not the substrate concentration, but the... the enzyme concentration. Yeah, I'm varying the enzyme concentration. So you can do that. Oh, I just dumped my calcium lactate. Uh, oh wait, no, this bowl has the calcium lactate in it, doesn't it? All right, I'm making a big old mess. So, yeah, you know what? I dumped my calcium lactate in the waste bowl, so I can't make the 15% yeast balls, which is too bad. But, but do you guys see how you would do that? You would just have a different concentration of yeast solution to see the enzyme concentration. So lots of fun stuff you can do at the lab. Any questions about this lab? This is a fun lab. It's a totally fun lab. Have you done it before? Or are you saying just yes. looks, yeah, it uh, is a fun yes. lab, isn't it? Yes. The, ki the kids really like doing this lab. They have a good time with this. Yes. All right. Any questions about enzymes? One quick question about the lab, Mary. So I've done this in the past with my regular biology kids and we've just tested pH. I guess would a way to kind of amp it up for AP would be giving them these different options, these different variables. Okay. Yeah, the way you could amp it up for AP is again, like on Monday when I have a short period, I'd go through the background information and I'd demonstrate how to make the yeast balls. And then I would, as part of their homework, I would ask them to go home and come up with an idea for a variable they want to test. What's your question? What's your independent variable? And just like with the photosynthesis labs, I'd put them in groups of three or four and each group would decide what variable they wanted to test because I don't want 30 different experiments going on at the same time. 10 is manageable, 30 is not. Any other questions? All right, well then I'm gonna go ahead and put let you guys go into uh, asynchronous time, some planning time for you, and then we'll meet back up here at one o'clock this afternoon, all right? Okay, I'm gonna end this so that I can post the recording. I'll post it to the, I'll add it to the detailed agenda, okay? All right, I'll see you guys at one o'clock. Bye. Uh, Mary, did you